thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, after nearly three years, it's fantastic to be back here uh, and great to see so many people here. Um, I'm aware that I'm the last speaker before lunch so, uh, and I also must apologise for my Spanish. Um, I, I'm, my Spanish is still very, very poor. But what I want to talk about today is looking at electrification, <laughs> looking at electrical energy vulnerability and looking at why that's important, how we're going to get around some of these problems with, uh, with energy. For those of you who, who don't know me, I, I work at the University of Nottingham in the UK and we have a very large research group looking at transportation, electrification and connecting renewable energy to the electricity grid. We have about 165 people, about 35 million uh, pounds, um, about 50 million US dollars worth of research. And we work across electrical machines, power electronic systems, motor drives and power electronic integration. All the technologies you need for transportation electrification or connecting the renewable energy systems to the grid, the type of uh, energy systems we've just been hearing about uh, this morning. It's a very busy slide, but what this is trying to show is the work that we do in applications such as aerospace, automotive, marine, in future electrical networks, uh, and also in a few industrial applications. Um, the other thing I will say, I, I lead a large research group. Not all the research that I'm going to present is mine. It's led by a number of people here all of whom's contribution I must acknowledge. So, when people talk about transportation electrification, and particularly our politicians, you would think it's a new technology. Um, it isn't a new technology. The oldest uh, I can find uh, of, a, of a photograph is uh, 1902, but the actual first electric cars appeared in 1839 nearly 200 years ago. So it's an old idea, but now we have the technology to hopefully make it happen. And that's the important message with this. If we look at how the emissions roadmap um, is envisaged, so this is looking at, uh, at the emissions from uh, automotive going out to 2050 and how we can reduce those emissions if we slowly take transportation away from petrol and gasoline and into more hybrid propulsion technologies. You'll notice hydrogen up there. My colleague was speaking about that uh, before. Uh, but you'll also notice some hybrid technologies that are there as part of that transition. It's very difficult for all of us to transition straight to electric transportation or even hydrogen transportation there is going to be a translation through hybrid propulsion systems first. Um, particularly in Chile, where you have a very large country uh, and you haven't, no countries yet, have the full infrastructure we need for this kind of revolution in the way we use energy. More on that in a moment. So, I did say the first electric car was 1839. Um, it might be in 1828 if you believe the Hungarian history books rather than the British history books. But uh, we won't worry too much about that. The peak of production was actually uh, in 1912 as a percentage of the production of vehicles. Uh, so in 1912, if you were going to buy a car, it may well have been electric. But by uh, 1928, all the electric car production had ended mainly due to concerns about cost and about range. It's interesting that those fears of 1928 are still reflected today. We're still talking about the range of an electric vehicle. We're still talking about the purchase cost of an electric vehicle and forgetting the fact that actually when we look at the cost of ownership, it's not such a problem. Uh, particularly with the, uh, the gas prices 
you'll see today. Um, I'm a power electronics engineer, so I thought I ought to have one or two pictures about power electronics. When we look at an electric vehicle, we always think of a battery, a motor drive, uh, uh, and the fact that that vehicle will then move. We also have to remember that we have to charge the vehicle, and we also have to remember that as we move to this all-electric vehicle, all the auxiliaries on your vehicle also have to be electric. At the moment, your air conditioning system is run using a compressor run from the engine. You can't do that with an electric system. We also use the heat from the engine to heat the interior of the car on a cold day. We don't have so much heat generated with an electric vehicle, particularly not when you look at some of the efficiencies we can achieve. So we have to remember all these auxiliary systems. Steering uh, and uh, suspension also may become electric rather than mechanical. So lots of things that are going to need to change. Uh, and we end up with some quite complicated diagrams there um, to look at uh, how those systems might come together. And we can, I'm a professor, we like to develop new technologies. Uh, and this is looking at trying to simplify some of the power electronics by bringing two functions together in one power electronic converter. So there's plenty of work we can do around that translation and around making these technologies available. Now, so that I can talk about some of the things to do with uh, our, our research in uh, electric vehicles, I just thought I'd mention our electric motorbike. This, this platform belongs to us as a university, so therefore I'm free to talk about it very openly. We do a lot of similar research with the companies we work with, but then we have commercial sensitivity. So, talking about the motorbike is always good, and it's also fun. The reasons we do uh, work with an electric motorbike is it's a great way to learn about technologies. It's a great platform because we know how this motorbike is going to be ridden. Um, we win some championships, we collect silverware, but it creates good publicity for the university and good publicity for transportation electrification. One of the things that uh, Tesla did or has done very successfully is to make electric cars exciting. It's not a slow car, it's a very, very fast car. Same with our motorbike. Okay, so this will go over 300 miles, uh, 300 kilometers an hour around a test track. Um, it will race and it races in some of the most uh, dangerous places uh, we're allowed to race motorbikes uh, in the world. Uh, and it's there to push the boundaries of technology. Now, the first thing we find with this, or any electric vehicle, is the battery is important. Just in the same way as with your mobile telephone. So I'm sure you all have one of these in your pocket, and every night you have to remember to charge it up. Okay, the reason for that is that you want it to be quite small, you don't want to pay too much money for it, and the battery technology doesn't allow the phone to, be, to go for much longer. Um, and this chart nicely shows where we are in terms of battery technologies. So although I've shown this as volumetric energy density and uh, galvanometric energy density, so how heavy and how big the battery will be, that line also follows time. So we started a long time ago with lead acid batteries. Some of us are old enough to remember uh, NICAD, nickel cadmium batteries, nickel metal hydride. For a short time we had some nickel zinc batteries, then we moved on to the various lithium based battery technologies. The other thing that this chart tells you is that battery technology changes with time and every time it changes batteries get smaller and lighter. I wish I knew what the next battery technology is. If I did, I'd be very, very, very rich. Okay? But when we find out, I think it will involve sodium, but that's just my, uh, my thoughts on this. Um, but when we do get that ne next technology, 
your phone will be charged once a week, not once per day, and we will have solved the problem of the range of electric vehicles, maybe even for flight as well as for cars and trucks. So an important technology. There's other things that are happening that is making this revolution possible. Okay, so electrochemists, chemical engineers are working on the batteries. As an electrical engineer, we're working on the propulsion system. One thing that's happened in power electronics in the last 10 years is we've had new device technologies. We've been having silicon carbide MOSFETs, gallium nitride devices are also coming along. So the so-called wide band gap semiconductor devices. Um, we've also been working on power electronic converter topologies uh, and some of the work that uh, you do here at the uh, Universidad de Talca is very relevant in that area as well. But this chart, particularly those bottom two there, show the difference between silicon devices and silicon carbide devices in terms of the efficiency of the power electronics. That's important, but something else is important, as we'll see in a moment. So we're able to improve the efficiency. The losses go down, the size and the weight goes down, and the um, amount of the electrical energy stored in our battery, that big heavy battery that's causing us to worry about the range of our car, all of a sudden we're using more of that for the propulsion of the vehicle and using, losing less of that in heat. Important. Power electronic converters are improving in terms of the power density. So we're trying to make things smaller and lighter. That doesn't necessarily make them cheaper, but it makes the whole system cheaper uh, and more efficient. And uh, recently I did a lot of work. It's amazing how one chart requires so much work behind it. But looking at how power electronic converters might get smaller and lighter over the next 30 years, both from standalone applications and also highly integrated, where the power electronics, the electrical machine, all become integrated into one package. You'll no longer have a nice box that says power electronics on it. That power electronics will become integrated into the complete system. Just like the power electronic converters in your mobile phone uh, integrated inside your phone today. We're going to see that same process in larger applications. So just to look at that aspect of integration, I thought I'd use the example of electric cars. In the, sorry, electric aeroplanes, as well as the previous example of electric cars. The aviation industry is beginning to look very closely of how much progress it's made in reducing CO2 emissions, and it's made a lot of progress, and um, how much more work it needs to do to get to the point where it meets the goals for 2050. So there's already a goal for 2050 to reduce the emissions from aircraft back to 50% of their levels in 2020. Okay, so that's a big reduction. To do that, there's various technologies that are making aircraft lighter and more efficient. I flew here on a Boeing 787, uh, which is made of carbon composites. It has very efficient engines. It has electric systems for the environmental control system and for wing de-icing, all making the aircraft more efficient. So we already have a whole load of known technologies um, and also things we can do with the operation of aircraft to reduce the emissions, the yellow area. The green area is the area that we still need to sort out. Now, one of the problems with aviation is that it takes at least 10 years to design a new aircraft. So we have to get these technologies ready very quickly if we're going to meet those goals in 2050. An aircraft lasts somewhere between 20 and 30 years of service and so to get that reduction in CO2 means that we need to be having very efficient aircraft in service in 10 to 15 years time. A big challenge for the industry. So what are we doing? Well, 
One of the things we can do is to go to electric propulsion. This doesn't mean that all aircraft will have batteries to store that energy. Some may have hydrogen, I hope so. Um, some may e even still have conventional fuels, but gas turbines driving generators. If we put electric fans on the wings, we create a more efficient aircraft because we have less drag and less weight. Um, so, if we accept that electric propulsion is a good idea and that we might be using a hydrogen fuel cell or a generator to create that electrical energy, then we need to make smaller, lighter, more efficient motors. And you can see here a roadmap for the size of aircraft over the next uh, 30 years. And we've plotted on there the electrical demonstrators that we've built in Nottingham over the last few years. Um, and you can see we're well ahead of that trend line. So on the left-hand side, you can see the electrical motors. On the right-hand side, you can see the planned uh, aircraft that will use that type of motor. And that's good. That's where we should be as university academics. We should be ahead of the industrial need. And that's exactly what that shows. The other thing about the electrical drives is we can see on this spider diagram here that in terms of lifetime, in terms of how long that electrical motor and power electronics will last, we've, we've got the technology. In terms of the power density and the efficiency, we're almost there. In terms of the cost, we're a long way off. So we've got the solution, it's just too expensive at the moment. So we've got some work to do to make things a little bit smaller and lighter a little bit more efficient and we have a lot of work to do to reduce the cost of making those converters. So propulsion is possible uh, for aircraft. Here's a small concept aircraft we've been looking at. The aircraft industry likes to take new technologies slowly. So this aircraft will have a conventional engine for one propeller and electric motors for two propellers. If part of that system fails, it doesn't matter, you will still get safely down to the ground. Part of the way they do safety in the aviation industry. And uh, we've been looking at various different hybrid architectures you might have. The one on the right is where you have a gas turbine driving a generator, some power electronic converters and some electric fans on the wing. The one on the left is slightly more conventional. We've got some con conventional gas turbines driving some uh, propellers, but also driving additional propulsion systems distributed elsewhere along the wings of the aircraft. Trying to bring together that, that system so that we have uh, an overall more efficient aircraft uh, and an aircraft that will do less damage to the environment. It's always good to say here's one we built earlier but here's one we built earlier. It's been tested on the ground, as you can see in the picture in the top right. And this is where we've taken the conventional turboprop engine for an aircraft, and we've wrapped around that an electric motor and a power electronic converter. Those of you who think that power electronic converters come in square boxes, this one's circular, like a donut with a hole in the middle, because the shaft to the propeller has to go through the middle of the power converter. So we have to think about the design and the integration of the power electronics in a different way to normal. It's very much a, a different type of uh, design and a different type of environment. All this was operating at 130 degrees centigrade. So we've successfully built this and successfully demonstrated this. And this technology allows them to use a smaller engine on a larger aircraft more efficient, it's more effective, and the electric motor is there to provide the peak of thrust when that's needed. Take off and climb, for example. How have we done that? Well, when we look at the technology bricks, the things that are advancing, we've got power electronics, mo modular multi-level converters, but we've got lots of other technologies feeding into the electrical machines. The low loss materials, the uh, advanced designs that additive manufacturing, 3D printing, allows us to achieve. Uh, 
various new technologies, and then at the centre of that we have the integration. And what we find is that these new technologies all have different levels of impact that they're going to have on the size and the weight of the propulsion systems. So as we move along the bottom axis there, we're looking at the technology readiness level. When will these technologies have an impact? Wide band gap semiconductors is very close to having that big impact. It will have that big impact quite soon and that impact is going to be very large. Other technologies, superconductivity, a great idea, but it's still at the very basic research level. It's not going to be flying on an aircraft in 10 years' time. Maybe 20. So we do that and we often end up building demonstrators. Now, there's other challenges for the adoption of uh, electrical systems. And we've seen some of this with the presentations we've had this morning. We need to get electrical energy from the place it's generated. And we saw the maps of Chile earlier on with a great deal of solar in the north, great deal of wind energy uh, available in the south, to the places where people want to charge their cars, the towns and the cities. And so we've got, uh, and on the, uh, on the journeys in between, uh, on Route 5 uh, in, in Chile. So we've got a lot of work to do in changing our electrical infrastructure around the world so that we can charge cars at the places where people are going to need to charge them. And this is different from moving uh, petrol and diesel gasoline around in tankers. Now we have to provide a permanent infrastructure that moves electrical energy. Or we move to a different energy vector such as hydrogen. And that's why these are interesting and possibly complementary technologies. Something else that's happening is the, the, the manufacture of batteries. We're seeing the, lots of gigafactories being planned to build all these batteries we're going to need in these electric vehicles. Flying or transporting batteries around the world is very difficult, so this is quite good news for, for different parts of the world because we need to have local manufacture of cells and batteries in lots of different countries around the world. And I think this is a great opportunity for Chile because you also have the, the natural resources needed for building the batteries at the moment. So lots of different things that are happening there. Uh, this focuses a little bit on cars and looking at the fact that we need lots of fast charging stations because we need high power, quick charging if we're going to drive uh, around a large country. Um, we need to be able to charge the car back up whilst we have a cup of coffee is the way I always think about that. If I can get my car charged back up whilst I have 20 minutes drinking a cup of coffee, I'm probably going to be happy with that. But that requires the technologies for fast charging the batteries. Now this leads us into this area of the energy vectors. How do we get the energy from where it's generated to where people live and where we need that electrical energy? And it leads back to one of the oldest arguments in el electrical energy. Do we have an AC system or do we have a DC system? This is an argument that's been going on ever since electricity was first generated. We have AC energy distribution at the moment because we can use transformers to increase and decrease the voltage. But now we have power electronics, so we could do that equally as easily with a power electronic converter and DC energy. And what we find is that if we look at all the infrastructure we need to transport electrical energy, when we get to a certain distance, it's cheaper to do it with DC than with AC. The reason for that is that there's an initial cost for a DC uh, converter station. Power electronics at the moment is more expensive than a transformer. Transformer is nice, simple, bit of copper and iron. Power electronics need silicon carbide devices, control platforms, and all the rest of it. Okay? The sorts of things that keep a number of us uh, uh, very busy for our careers. So those power converters cost money. But the infrastructure, the cables that you need, are smaller and lighter and use less material. 
So as you go in, up in distance, the DC system gets cheaper. Now, something interesting here, the crossover point is somewhere between 500 and 800 kilometers. So this point here, where it's cheaper to be with DC, over land, let's say five to 800 kilometers. In a country like Chile, that makes sense. In a country like mine, in the United Kingdom, we have a very small island. I'm not sure it makes quite so much sense. But we are doing this under sea, so when we're generating electrical energy out at sea and bringing it on land, then we use uh, DC systems. So the, the concept on the left there is can we create a DC supergrid to connect <coughs> countries together? Uh, in Europe, we have more wind in the north and more solar in the south. Exactly the opposite to the, to the system you have here in Chile, where, as we heard earlier, you have plenty of solar energy in the north uh, and, uh, and plenty of, uh, of wind energy in the south. And I'm just pleased that my diagram matches almost exactly with the, with the ones we heard earlier on in this session. So, can we come up with these big high voltage DC networks? And I think you've got a big opportunity in Chile compared to Europe. In Europe, we can't even all agree to still be in the same European Union. The UK left, so-called Brexit. Okay? So how on earth are we going to have the economic agreements to actually make that network possible? In Chile, maybe you can. Um, the other thing we have to invest on is workforce. What, one of the things we're seeing is a big shortage in trained engineers to work in this industry. So those of you in the room who are studying uh, energy uh, or electrical engineering or any of the related disciplines, it's a great time to be an engineer uh, and there are plenty of jobs out there. Really are plenty of jobs out there. So just to uh, conclude, COVID-19 has caused a slight blip in demand, but it's not significant in terms of the timescales of the roadmaps that we're talking about here. The technology development is essential. Power electronics, uh, electrical machines and energy storage are the keys to that. And as we've been hearing today, there's a lot of technologies needed and a lot of different thinking needed if we're going to make these technologies work for us in the future. Thank you very much for listening um, and uh, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. <laughs>